All right. Welcome, everybody, uh, to this very quick talk I put together called Music Systems and Live Recording, Creative Constraints. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but uh, I hope to be, be in person there next year. I hope everyone's having a great time, everyone's staying safe and enjoying the shows and all the cool learning experiences here. Um, this is going to be a pretty basic kind of entry level overview of things I learned throughout the years about um, the importance of planning music systems and how planning those systems will eventually inform our live recording process. Um, so after this talk, you should uh, have a good starting point for planning and recording live music for your game, whether it's a, a small game or, or a larger game. Um, let's jump right into it. Uh, yeah, so uh, hello. I already said hello, but I'll say it again. My name is John Everest. Uh, I am the composer for many uh, titles, some you might be familiar with, and of course, uh, a bunch of cool announced things, as we say. Uh, thing one, thing two, thing three. Um, every talk, you know, that I see that's worth its salt uh, seems to start with a quote, so I thought I'd do, uh, do that as well. Um, to achieve great things, you need a plan and not quite enough time. Um, this is uh, Leonard Bernstein, but who the hell really knows? I've heard uh, conflicting reports on that. But, um, you know, this is kind of a basic talk about getting a clear vision for your music system and how that can influence every aspect of the music process from budget to implementation to um, stems and uh, shipping a great game. All right, so a quick table of contents for stuff we're going to talk about. Um, first, uh, I'm going to go over music systems very briefly, just like, you know, popular ones and different types that uh, we often see in the business. Uh, two, I'm going to go over um, essentially what I call defining the pillars of your music system. So I think in game development, we have uh, game pillars, and I think we should have music pillars as well. Um, third, we're going to talk about how these pillars are going to affect your execution, how they're going to actually define the way you uh, set up your project and end up recording. And then four, and finally, we're going to talk about a little bit about how um, recording with live musicians or full orchestra or soloists or both, um, what's a good approach, where you can find... Uh, low-hanging fruit and how you can make do with pretty much any budget uh, with live recording. All right, so first we're going to quickly, you know, talk about music systems. Um, I have Wise up here because that is uh, uh, the music system that that I use most often. Um, you know, we have many different music systems in the industry. Uh, Wise is by Audio Kinetic. It's it's quite popular. It was recently purchased by PlayStation, uh, but it's used in in many games, uh, lots of AAA games, uh, even indie games. Um, F Mod is also very popular. We have Elias Software. Um, we have music systems that are built into engines already. So like Unreal and Unity have pretty robust music systems that you can do very cool things with. So don't discount those as music systems. Uh, Fabric is another one um, that has been on the scene recently. And then, of course, there are bespoke systems. So systems that um, uh, the developers or you will create yourself. Um, these are all systems that essentially interface with the engine or the game itself and provide a way to put music into the game. So your music system... I think it's important to look at your music system as a creative tool, right? Um, I think often composers either don't have time to think about a music system or really they're not involved in the music system at all. They could really be working with game teams that essentially want them to de just deliver stems and cut downs uh, as granular as possible and that's it. And sometimes we have no say literally. so. For those types of projects, ignore everything I'm saying in this presentation. But for the smaller mid mid core games, some AAA games, you do have access to music systems and influencing how things are put in the game or, and um, 
middleware is like a DAW. It's a creative resource, right? There's many ways to skin a cat. If I want to do something with a piece of music, I can do several, do it several different ways with a program like Wise. So, you know, don't limit yourself um, too much with how you're trying to solve problems, right? You'll come up with, you'll, you'll be presented with several problems throughout the process. And it's important to see WISE as like a, or the program as a fungible tool that you can, you know, do interesting things with, uh, throw curveballs at, find creative ways to solve your music problems. Um, but the main thing that I, I love about these music systems is that when you define them early on in the process, they really end up informing the way you write music. So what I mean by that is once you have a, a, an idea of how your music system is going to be set up, you understand that, okay, I need whatever it is, this many layers. I know there's going to be this sort of inter interactivity happening, and then there's going to be these transition points, these pivot points, these ways to modulate the score. And it really does affect the way you approach writing a piece of music after that. Um, and I think the more that the music system is in tune with the compositional process, the more natural it feels when it's put into a game. Um, so this goes on to what I mentioned a bit earlier is, is the importance of defining what I call the pillars of your game. And I also kind of call it the, the minimum viable interactivity. Um, so we want the music to be as interactive as possible, but you know, this is video games so we want to have a shippable product, right? So if all else fails, we want to be able to ship a product with a minimum amount of interactivity that is very effective. Um, and what I mean by that is that, uh, usually when developers are developing a game, they, they get together and they create game mechanics or gameplay pillars that really define like the gameplay loop of the game um so it's what makes the game a game it's jumping it's anti-gravity it's time slowing it's portals it's combat and sneaking that sort of thing um so in that sense it's really important to play the game as much as possible very early on even even if it's just blocks and blobs and stuff just to understand the flow and how things work in the game um you know interfacing with the devs to understand what their intentions are, you know, that could be an early on in the game, but they could say, oh, you know, we're really trying to bring out this certain element of the gameplay loop and thinking to yourself, how can music help elevate that process? Um, so once you've figured this out, you have the most important gameplay engine pillars, you really can start to attach uh, music interactivity to these things that will affect how the music is behaving in the game and essentially build your own pillars for the music system. Something that is a foundation that the music uh, for future in the game will build off of, right? So we're talking very high level, very simplistic in a way, um, uh, uh, infrastructure that your music system will stand upon and build off of. So I think we've all seen this sort of setup before. Um, this is what I would call a kind of a version of of the 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 sneak in combat or explore in combat that is you know pretty popular in games. This is sort of that minimum interactivity that that we're talking about. So you have the music system up top. Um, uh, you know, and we're branching between two overall switches or states of the game. You're either in an ambient mode or you're in a combat mode and switching between ambient mode and combat mode is uh, tied together by a short transition segment of music. We know we need ambient cues, we need combat cues, and we need transition segments to kind of tie them together. And then as you can see, going deeper with that, as we've got this base, we can have uh, different intensity levels for each uh, segment if we want to. So combat can be affected by several different things. Ambience can be affected by several different things. These are all tied into the game engine pillars themselves. Um, building on that foundation of this hierarchy, just keep going deeper, keep going more granular if you can. 
Um, so like if we look into it, the ambient, uh, even more specifically, you're separating the ambience by areas in the game. You could have random cont containers uh, inside of each sections of the ambient itself. So each musical section has like a B section and an A section. And those are all randomized. And even inside those random containers, you could have stems that are randomized as well. So you're really trying to create um, evolving, changing, constantly um, uh, moving uh, pieces and, and try not to have that uh, trap of a loop sort of happening over and over again. Um, even further than that, something tying into a, an existing system in a game like an enemy awareness level um, could end up changing uh, the music through an RTPC or a real-time parameter controller. Um, or it could change the whole music itself. It could change the stems. You know, it's kind of limitless. So as you go deeper, you know, there's many different options for interactivity. Um, so we have vertical uh, approaches and horizontal approaches, and you can always mix those two together. What I mean by vertical is something that is stemmed out into different sections that play on top of each other and are affected by what's happening in the game. So let's say like your health gets low. So a certain ostinato stem um, of your orchestra gets louder at that point, or there's a low pass filter or something like that. Um, horizontal is more like changing changing music to different sections based on what's going on in the game. So those those things are, are, are happening, I think, simultaneously. And as the game is continued to develop the base that you've built of the basic, you know, ambient um, combat starts to get more complex. So you can keep going deeper as you go. Um, and we'll go into this later, but recording stems um, is is usually a good idea because it gives you more um, control over how to make variations in your music by the systems. So here's a quick screenshot from one of uh, one of the battle tech cues in Wise, and you can see this is like the this is showing the vertical approach. So each one of these waveforms is a as a stem, and each stem um, is being changed or interacted with by an RTPC, depending on what's happening in the game. Um, those pieces are coming in or out uh, to to give some sense of interactivity. All right, so. You know, now that you've sort of dug deep, you've established the pillars, you've got a good base for music and you keep expanding upon it. Um, this is where we like to take, or I, I personally like to take a look at what I'm working with in terms of recording budget and really picking out the things that I think are more important and most impactful to um, uh, getting, uh, getting our intentions across for what we're trying to do with the game. Um, so this involves a lot of like how you set up your DAW, right? Because your stemming system or how you're um, exporting things from your DAW and putting them into the middleware um, is going to affect how you end up recording, right? If you're recording live, you know, oh, I'm, 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 I've got interactivity with my low strings happening all the time. So I know I want to stripe those. I want to record those separately because I need them isolated in order to get them to work with my system the way I, I need it to be. Um, so a lot of this knowledge comes from having good mockups and implementing them in the game and toying around with how they're implemented. Um, because looking at your digital mockups, you want to really, at least in my opinion, be able to replace those digital assets with live recordings really easily without having to mess with them too much. And that just requires a lot of planning, right? It's also really important to not forget that major themes, start menus, cinematics, that sort of thing, those are usually where live recording, large orchestra, or, or putting a lot of the budget really shine, right? Because they're, you know, very big... Um, uh, explorations of musical ideas and, and themes of the game. And you can't forget that a lot of your budget is probably going to be devoted to those. 
So, and those aren't that interactive usually. So, um, you know, make sure you have a chunk left aside to still cover major themes and cinematics. And we're continuing to go deeper, get deeper, go deeper, deeper. Um, uh, so I'm just going to show a quick example. I've, I've shown this like in other talks and stuff. This is how we uh, we basically solved a problem uh, where uh, BattleTech is is pretty slow game in terms of how fast things happen, and getting to a waypoint was it was this really monumental point in the game, but it was not landing because of how slow the the mechs were getting there. So what I was able to do because of the system I, I had created that already had these sort of RTPCs in place, I could get a 30 second loop from a live recording that wasn't even intended for this and add a bunch of stems to it and have the game interact with how close you were to the waypoint so that it would turn up these stems um, the closer you got to make it sound um, more heroic as you went. So let's just listen to that real quick. Yeah, and, and, you know, interactivity is not always like, you know, in your face. It shouldn't be always, obviously, in your face. You, you know that uh, uh, things are changing and moving. It can be very subtle stuff. You know, I've done, done things where really subtle changes in the music that is, are, are kind of imperceptible to um, people that are playing, um, but do affect the way that they feel while they're playing. Uh, those sort of sorts of things are very cool to kind of tie on to. Um, so this is another example from Battletech. We had one giant piece of music for your ship, uh, but depending on where you were in the ship, the music kind of changed slightly, sometimes dramatically, sometimes very, very, very subtly. So it could be like you're in the main brig and, or the main uh, deck and um, it's, you know, uh, the background piece is playing and then you go to another room and it slowly fades down and a guitarist come, comes up and starts plucking away, for example. See you later. Welcome to Engineering, Commander. Happy to be here. All right, so it kind of we've we've touched on this a little bit, but um you know, this is the point after you've sort of proven your system with some mock-ups and you've kind of understood what your most important pieces are in terms of the most impact that you can get for uh, recording, it's time to start 
planning your recording and uh, getting that process started. Um, and you know, this is a kind of a, a cheeky sentence why you uh, do not need or do need orchestral music in your game. Um, you know, I would never say that any particular game either needs or doesn't need orchestral music in it because what are our goals as composers? Uh, it's all about supporting the story, the story, world, and characters, right? Our job uh, is to elevate these things, create empathy, create interest, create contrast, uh, create uh, questions, shine light, and present um, emotional language to the game, right? Um, so orchestral music is effective because it's incredibly good at eliciting deep feelings and empathetic responses in listeners. Um, and I think the commonality of orchestral music and film music, video game music, is that there's a human element involved in live recording, right? So some things like Battletech uh, or Disintegration, for example, they call for a hybrid approach, right? Like there's orchestral elements, but it's also balanced by soloists and live recording from other sources, percussion, uh, me playing whatever the hell I have laying around. So yeah, I mean, let's, let's face it, budget and time is one of the biggest constraints for us. We have to kind of make do with what we have in terms of budget and time. And I'm of the mind that more live recording, more live human elements put into the score, the better, even if it's, um, you know, me plucking away on, uh, on the, uh, Euro rack or tooling around with synths and, and smashing, uh, garbage cans and hitting drums and stuff. Those things add the spice and the flavor of the human element to scores. Um, so whether it's 75 piece orchestra or one person banging on a drum uh, in their uh, studio apartment, doesn't matter. Do what you can with what your budget and time uh, afford and make sure you're focusing on what you're trying to say and, uh, rather than how you're trying to say it. And so we talked about this uh, already, but you know, we've already sort of proved our music system with um, our digital mockups. Um, so this is really going to affect our budget and time for recording because now that we know how the system works, we know how we need to record. We know what sort of stems and what sort of striping we need to do and all the little transition segments and um, interactivity portions that we should be recording live. And so I said before, you know, the two biggest considerations that I think of when deciding what to record um, is, is impact. What's going to have the most impact? Um, some things don't need live recording. Here's a piece from Battletech that does have strings and choir, but it's all, di uh, it's all digital. So let's hear what that sounds. So yeah, for that, there's no need to, to record anything live. It's the, the samples are doing fine relatively. It's kind of a background piece anyway. So we're going to keep that digital. We're going to trust our ear and we're going to understand, um, what live, live players can add. And we're going to prioritize, prioritize what has the most impact. So that's things like exposed melodies, um, things like major themes, and that could even just be hiring a soloist to, to beef up a melody line. Let's say like there's the melody and strings and you want to just get your uh, violinist friend of yours to come in and uh, overlay on top of your, your uh, samples to, to add a little bit of um, human element to those. So with impact, it's 
it's all about choosing your battles, right? So, uh, some some of these cues require subtle enhan enhancements, while others are are better enhanced by doing the full thing with full ensemble. Um, here's a piece from Disintegration. Uh, it had an interesting mix of, of synths and, and orchestra, but you know we didn't have the full budget to do the whole entire thing live with like a full gigantic orchestra. Um, so. You know, certain parts I knew I had to prioritize for impact, um, and because of some of the techniques that I wanted, uh, uh, we had to do those live because they were difficult to do with samples. Uh, so here's an example of how we kind of used that to enhance um, this piece of music uh, with a, a small chamber string ensemble. Also going that going further disintegration again, you know we didn't have the full full orchestra, uh, but we did prioritize our low brass and chamber strings to uh, you get a big brassy sound. Try to add some human element into the strings, especially, um, and try to capture a large sound without having a gigantic budget. So here's an example of that, like kind of all together. That's all um, I've got for now. I know it's a quick uh, talk, lots of stuff. I mean, there's, uh, you know, we could talk about these 
processes of music systems and live recording for hours and hours and hours. Um, so I'm sure there's uh, questions. And uh, if you ever have any questions, please reach out to me. It's my email address, uh, Twitter and Instagram there. And uh, really appreciate it. Hope to uh, be there in person next year. Take care.